for a moment. Yeah, Mike gets fans from 9 p.m. live music from Coco, an interview with the band before that. What? What's your first step right now in the countdown to the big show in the small venue right here exclusive to Radio 1? My Chemical Romance fans might have some strong language. So if you are offended by strong language, well, you want to be, you know, take our apology and please, you know, please accept it in case anything does crop up in the next sort of 90 minutes or next sort of couple of hours, two and a half hours as we get close to the gig. But we are live on the radio. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Nope. It's My Chemical Romance. Listen to the next 30 minutes to hear the story of the band from high school geeks to superheroes on Radio 1. Belleville, New Jersey, 1987. A lonely young boy walks down the street. A comic catches his eye. What's this? The X-Men? You're too low, Angel. Fly higher. You serve no purpose but to increase my rage. I guess X-Men really appealed to me because they weren't, like, pretty... And they weren't rich. And so, like, they were, like, kind of saving the world, but nobody knew they existed. I liked them because they were really disadvantaged. From that moment on, the young Gerard Way knew he was different. And that one day he, too, would use his special powers to help the world. We are! We love My Chemical Romance. They're exciting and thrilling, and they're just a brilliant band. They look great, they sound great. They're the whole package. Just the way that they inspire everyone, it's such a fantastic message. They're the outcasts of life, and it's absolutely fantastic. That, you know, they've, they've risen so high. They always wanted to, to help people and move people. I think that still motivates them to this day. But they're sent from goals. Honestly, that's how amazing they are. Sent from God? Some people think so. But maybe, just maybe, these five outcasts are the world's strangest superheroes. No emo teenage death cult are these, but just a misunderstood group of outsiders driven to help their fans here to save the planet. Introducing our heroes, I give you My Chemical Romance. My name is Bob Breyer, and I play drums in the band My Chemical Romance. I'm Ray, and I play guitar. Mikey, and I play bass. My name is Frank, and I play guitar. This is Gerard Way, and I sing in the band. These five came together to experience adventures more incredible than any humans have ever known. And it all began in New Jersey, a suburb of New York City, with our first hero, some say heartthrob, Gerard Way. I was born April 9th, 1977, in um, Summit, New Jersey. I don't know why I was born in Summit. They probably just had a good hospital. But I lived all my life in Belleville, New Jersey. It's actually right next to Newark, New Jersey. It's just very industrial. It's one of the more crime-heavy areas, but it's the cherry blossom capital of the world. To understand the world's strangest heroes, we need to know what they were like growing up. Were they already marked out as outsiders from an early age? Me and Gerard kind of lived in a bubble. This is Mikey Wade. He's singer Gerard's younger brother. Hung out with each other. You know, I didn't have many friends in high school because I dressed differently. Like the classic case of, you know, me in the back of the room drawing on my notebook, not really participating in school. We spent a lot of time reading comic books. We, we lived a lot in our heads. We played... Star Wars stuff a lot, and we couldn't really play outside very much. It wasn't the safest area, um, and it was very hard to find kids to play with that weren't like robbing bikes or starting gangs. So me and Mikey just stuck together. We had like one or two friends, and that was it. Gerard and Mikey weren't the only ones to experience isolation. Here's another member of the band, guitarist Frank Aiero. Definitely never felt like I fit in. In the, in the uh, academic world, never fit in school, never had like a, a real group of friends that liked me for who I was or, or liked the things that I liked. I tried to fit in, but didn't really succeed that well. And here's Ray Toro, curly-haired and talented guitarist. You could call him the outsider of outsiders. 
a classic metal fan and a sea of punk kids who is experiencing New Jersey life mainly from the inside of his house. Pretty much 24, 25 years I, I lived with my parents and I didn't go out very much. I hung at home most of the time. I didn't have, um, I didn't have a lot. I had some friends in school and, and then later on in high school, but for, mo for the most part after school I would just come home and I remember um, doing things like computer related and video game related with my family like that was kind of a big thing with me and my brothers and, and my dad too I don't know if anybody remembers the Atari 2600 mm -hmm. was like a huge like that was like the cutting edge of technology when that came out and you know the whole family would sit around this giant Zenith TV that also played board games at the kitchen table like once a week. Lots of Trivial Pursuit, lots of Clue. I know especially my mom was kind of uh, like to see me stay either you know very close to home or you know stay inside. School was that point where it starts to stuff. Yeah, that's about the point where you realize if you fit in or not. And I didn't. You kind of become either the weird kid or the fat kid or whatever it is you become at that point. I was one of the weird kids. The boys and girls in the clique, the awful names at the stick. You're never gonna fit in, much kid. Don't think Gerard's overstating his own weirdness. Others who knew him and Mikey can confirm their status as genuine outsiders. They said. Uh, I'm Alex Saavedra, president of Eyeballs here in New Jersey. I've known Gerard and Mikey for years. We used to tease Mikey about looking like Harry Potter, tease uh, Gerard about you know never leaving his house or playing Dungeons and Dragons, but we were all outsiders and we all got along well because of that. Mikey, when he was younger, wasn't a very confident guy, but he was one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Gerard was on and off strange. Sometimes he'd like to hang out, and other times he'd be gone for six months. And he would just be in his basement drawing. Drawing and smoking cigarettes, drawing and smoking cigarettes is all he would do sometimes. He'd get so engulfed with himself with drawing that he would just disappear. Early on, it became apparent that the young Gerard had an extraordinary talent. Not for music, but for drawing. About middle school, I got real serious about being an artist because I actually realized it was the one thing that separated me in a positive way from everybody else. And it was the one thing that I could do that a lot of kids couldn't. The first week of high school, I completely didn't fit in, even less so. I was wearing an army jacket, some kind of ghost rider, t some kind of t-shirt with a skull on it or a heavy metal shirt. And I really was a complete and total loner. At lunch, I would down the table from me were these seniors that were all like metalheads. So they all realized I can draw, so then they all wanted tattoos, even though they were, I think they were kind of too young to get them, or maybe some were 18. And so I drew this werewolf for this kid, which is pretty awesome, and he got it tattooed, and I was like, wow, this is crazy, like, I just drew something, and somebody got tattooed on their body. And it got me in with them, they, they liked me because I could draw. And realizing that you had this special ability was a big advantage. To describe that special ability, or superpower if you like, is Gerard's first art teacher from elementary school. I'm Ken Birdie. I was Gerard's teacher in uh, number four school. He had quite a talent, and he was always into comics. He always had comic books with him, especially like Wolverine. He, he sort of, I don't know if he identified with the character, but sort of a loner with the dark side maybe, you know? Could it be that comics fan Gerard was gasp, relating to the geeky but talented outsiders of the X-Men series? I guess X-Men really appealed to me because they weren't like pretty and they weren't rich. They were like kind of saving the world but nobody knew they existed and they didn't get any credit for anything and they were hunted down. So I liked them because they were really disadvantaged. They seemed way more real. Doom Patrol was a comic that Grant Morrison revitalized for DC about the time I was 15 and I worked at a comic shop. The Doom Patrol was even more disadvantaged than the X-Men, and that made it even more interesting to me. Gerard's outsider isolation was creating a dark sensibility. Gerard did the only thing he could. He went to art school in New York, and there he met a teacher who only added to his gothic outlook. I actually had a, a teacher named Mr. Leffelbein who died first year into art school, I think. 
kind of young. He was actually the first guy that taught me a lot of... He had a real grim outlook, and I love that about him. One day he told me, like, you know, you better really enjoy your own company, because one day you're going to be alone. Anyway, everybody's alone one day. One day, even when you die, if you have people around, you're still alone. You still do that alone. So you got to be at peace with yourself. And I think that was the first time I was able to get over this girl dumping me. My first relationship, this girl dumped me. And, and that's when I realized, hey, you know what? I really should maybe just enjoy my own company. You know, this song is about living inside the dream and finding out that one day it's dead and you're in it. Hey, this is Gerard Way from My Chemical Romance, and you're listening to the story of our band on Radio 1. It was at this stage in his life that Gerard very nearly became a successful cartoonist and was in talks with the Cartoon Network to produce a series called The Breakfast Monkey. He doesn't even really look like a monkey. That was the best part. He kind of looked like a cross between like a Japanese cartoon version of a monkey and the Pillsbury Doughboy. And I always envision him speaking kind of in a Scandinavian accent like Bjork. It's a bit like Pinocchio. And he had this superpower called breakfast magic, and he could just make breakfast appear out of thin air. His um, friends were a Spanish wrestler and a, a kid that was so sugar damaged that he was in, actually <laughs> I never got made. And I knew that art was almost like a diversion. I was good at it, but I didn't have the heart that it takes to succeed at it. <laughs> And then, in 2001, something happened that changed everything forever. The birth of our superhero came from a global disaster that shook America to its very core. We have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. We looked out at it, all of a sudden, boom. Got people running up the street. September 11th, the year 2001, a day unlike any other in the long course of American history. I saw the towers go down, one by one, and um, I was very close to that across the bay and I was surrounded by about 300 or so family and or co-workers of people that were in that building and I felt to an extent that I didn't have a right to feel as upset as them because I didn't know anybody in there but I felt for them and they were so upset I guess that was when I developed a strong sense of empathy which I have to this day what I'd felt for them was so intense that it took me a good year to deal with that I wanted to actually do something I felt was important. And I just thought it was a real good time to call up some people and say, hey, you know, are you pretty much dissatisfied with the way your life is going? Because I'm really dissatisfied. I'm in my early 20s. I really don't like the way my life's going. I feel kind of screwed and I want to fix it. And I feel like that I'm special and I feel like you're special and we can show the world something really special. And that was kind of my attitude about it. And with that, Gerard began summoning together his fantastic fivesome, guitarist Ray Toro. I think I was in my fourth year of college at the time. I was working for a watch company called Movado. Yeah, Gerard gave me a call and I hadn't talked to him in a while. Gerard's brother, Mikey Way. Oh man, I was working at Barnes & Noble. It was just a bookstore and I thought at the time, I was like, I'm gonna be stuck in retail hell forever. I, that's what I thought. That retail hell led to the naming of the band. As Mikey was stacking books in Barnes and Noble, he saw the title of an Irving Welsh book, Ecstasy, Three Tales of Chemical Romance. And the name of the band was born, Ray. All of us, I think, were kind of at that point where you know, we were all looking for what, where are our lives going and what are we going to be. Eyeball Records founder and friend, Alex. I thought they were incredible. I was, I was really happy because all the bands that all of them were in beforehand were terrible. So <laughs> they really were. And then all of a sudden they came together and they got this. 
Gerard. I remember it very vividly. Alex had a really good feeling about us, and he said, look, let me just, I know this guy, he's real good, let me just throw you in the studio and see what you guys do, because you guys have never recorded a song, you guys are playing gigs, but let's let's get something on tape or whatever. And uh, we went to do Vampires, and it was still to this day like the most magical, incredible recording experience I've ever been a part of next to really make it the Black Parade. But nothing beats your first time on a mic. There was an energy. It wasn't that I was nervous or anything. There was just this energy. This storm was building outside. Everybody had tracked the instruments, and it was sounding incredible, you know? I was very inspired, and I was outside with Alex, and he just clocked me in the face. He was getting really hard on himself. You could tell, and he was really losing it. So I helped him focus, and uh, I punched him. That's what he wanted. I asked him. I warned him. He wanted it, so it helped him focus. And it worked, because I nailed it right away. We listened to that thing the whole way home at max volume in the van, over and over on repeat, everybody. And we just were blown away about how incredible the sound was. And if the sun comes up, will it tear the skin? At this stage, the newly formed My Chemical Romance decided they needed more guitar. Step forward, another broken man looking for direction, Frank Iero. I was at, like, the first 11 My Chemical Romance shows, but not in the band. If they didn't ask me to, to join, I would have probably asked them to be, like, their roadie. As soon as I joined, we were recording a record. I had to write parts in the van outside while they were recording because I didn't hadn't written all my parts yet. Right from there, we just went on tour. Gerard. There was a signing frenzy. All these major labels were like, all right, well, New Jersey's like the next Seattle, you know? So they all like converged. We were getting calls in our practice space before we'd even recorded. We were like, oh, this is weird. It didn't feel right. We asked the labels to actually just leave us alone until we were ready if that ever even happened. It did happen. By their second album, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, they were signed to Reprise Records, part of Warner's, and their mission to take on the world took off once and for all. Fame and success beckoned to these once shy and awkward New Jersey kids. The lockup in session tonight. From one of the biggest bands of 2004. It will be My Chemical Romance. And I'm really happy to go over now to Maida Vale, where we should find My Chemical Romance. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mikey Girard from My Chemical Romance. Thanks for dropping by. What's up? No problem. Uh, we're just hanging out. Drinking coffee. Drinking yeah, coffee. hanging out with you. But no superhero rise to stardom comes without upset. Along the way, Gerard and Mikey's much-beloved grandmother died. He wrote Helener in her memory. Immediately after recording the second album, they got rid of their original drummer, Matt, in mysterious and still unexplained circumstances. Gerard. It's that kind of thing. It, there's a lot that doesn't need to be said about it. They were a man down, but they had just the guy to pick up his drumsticks. Bob Breyer, sound guy with fellow The Used and fan of My Chemical Romance. I got the call when I was on tour, and I left the next day. I left tour, got in the van, and... We went, we practiced for a day, and then shot the Not Okay video the next day. But by this time, Gerard was feeling the pressure and had to battle the triple-headed monster of depression, alcohol, and drugs. It was just a brief period where I got out of control. But, um, uh, you know, I'm an alcoholic, and I've been clean almost three years now, so that feels great, you know. And I'm trying to think of the lows. The lows were just a severe depression and a feeling of helplessness, which is what drugs and alcohol do to you. You know, there was cocaine, pills, booze. If not for the band, I don't actually know if I would have had a purpose or a reason to get clean or stay clean and continue to live. It's the one thing that gave me a sense of importance or uh, 
duty in a lot of ways, actually. Like, I felt like I had a duty to the band. If you or someone you know are severely depressed, you need to talk to somebody, your best friend, your mom, somebody in school, because pissing away your life on suicide is bullshit. We're the band of My Chemical Romance, and you are listening to a documentary about the band on Radio 1. Woo! And so to the one thing that this band of superheroes holds more dear than anything else. Their purpose in life, their mission, the people they're here to save, their fans. I'm Nicola Brown, I'm the associate editor at Kerrang! magazine. Gerard is worshipped by the fan base, um, and when you go to a show you can see that for sure. Like, there'll be girls queuing up and screaming. <laughs> um, the band just came up onto the roof and yeah, we just kind of went a bit wild. Half my wardrobes like their stuff. I listen to them all the time. They're just amazing. I don't know what it is about their music that just feel, they feel like they get you and they know what you go through. Hardness of like growing up and just everyday life and stuff you go through. It's always been about who you are and to not care about what other people think of you and even if you're the underdog to stick in there. You know what you say to them? You say, you cannot destroy me! You cannot destroy me! They mean so much to me. Their message is absolutely like heartfelt. I've never seen a band have so much enthusiasm and heart. They're the most important aspect of my life besides friends and family. I'm ill a lot and that and I've been in hospital quite a few times and when I've had nights where I can't sleep, I'm in so much pain, it's then that's helped me get through it. calling to them. They don't exploit themselves in any way possible. They do it for their fans. Did you ever see rock dudes asking you to show them your tits for a backstage pass? I want you to spit right in their face! Guitarist Frank Ayura. I think one of the main messages is to be happy with who you are, whoever that is. You don't have to change yourself to other people's likings. You know, our shows feel like the place that you can go where you don't fit in anywhere else. It's a community now where kids are finding people just like them. And that's what the mission is. Nothing you can say can stop me going home. Um, you guys are playing Reading and Leeds yeah. this weekend, and nice, right? And nice to just come out there Very and nice. we put a few new tracks in the set. Yes, Wicked. we will. It's going to be great, man. I mean, you guys are playing on a great day, you know. Oh, the irony of Zane Lowe's optimism. For you know, even superheroes make enemies. Superman had Lex Luthor as his evil nemesis. My Chemical Romance had the crowds at Reading Festival. The Daily Mail, who called them a teenage death cult, and indie rockers Kasabian, who said they encouraged people to self-harm. Yikes! I want to see you all! Kind of tame, though, in comparison to what happened at this year's Reading Festival, when the war against emo erupted on stage with My Chemical Romance. They were attacked with gulp bottles of urine, amongst other things. They started uh, throwing bottles, and then it was more like people were throwing bottles because they thought it was fun. They didn't necessarily hate us, and uh, at some point during the set, people stopped pretty much throwing bottles, and I think we kind of won over a lot of people. Emo's become a really dirty word, and I personally don't understand why it has. Nicola Brown, Kerrang! magazine. I think people think that emo bands are crybaby wimps that sit around crying because girls don't fancy them and um, they've got no social skills, but that's not true at all. I think it's just a really lazy way of describing emo bands. People that don't know much about My Chemical Romance would assume that because they wear stage makeup and they sing about death and vampires, that they're quite miserable and uh, they're the sort of people that would sit around cutting their arms up with razor blades and crying into their backpacks. And it's just an absolute misrepresentation of who My Chemical Romance are and, and who the My Chemical Romance fans are too. Blood, blood. 
gallons of the stuff Give them all that they can drink And it will never be enough And this is what the fans make of it all That's the same thing that happened to Marilyn Manson If you really listen to what they're speaking about And what they're talking about It's more about life than death They've been stereotyping the gloom band The death band And it's it's totally not true Their fans know who they are They're true to them They're true to themselves And they wouldn't ever go and harm themselves in any way one could be confused, of course, if you just look at the song titles of the latest album, The Black Parade. Bob. People that don't get into the record and don't really listen to the record and understand what the record's about are going to look at it and see, like, the second song is called Dead. You know, that's the whole point behind this record is that this record is the most uplifting kind of live your life record that I've heard. It's called The Black Parade. Yeah. It's a concept album. Um, we've always been toying around with concepts from our first record, but I mean, it's the story of a man called The Patient, and he starts up in a hospital, and he dies right away. And <laughs> basically, from that point on, you, you go on this odyssey, and he examines his life and the mistakes that he's made. And yeah. I'm, uh, his strongest memory is his memory from the childhood of his father taking him to see this parade. So when death comes for him, it comes as a parade. Yeah. And so our alter egos on this record is a band yeah. called the Black Parade and it's pretty fun actually to be the Black Parade. It's your Bohemian Rhapsody. It's incredible. It, it's, it's, it was definitely inspired heavily by Queen and, and Annie. For this third album, the band made the final superhero transformation. Now come on, come on to this tragic affair. Finally, they realized their true superhero natures, cast aside their drab everyday clothes, and stepped into matching costumes. Forget X-Men, forget Doom Patrol. The Black Parade was not just an album title. The band are The Black Parade. Wearing the outfit on stage, like even just putting it on before we play, it puts you in a really weird mood and a really weird mindset. And you feel like you're a whole different person. And you go on the stage and you play those songs and you really feel like you're a character with those on. It changes the way the show looks and it changes the way that we all feel, which then changes the way that we perform. It's kind of uncomfortable a little bit to play drums in a big coat, but it's worth it. Another contusion, my funeral jag. Here's my resignation. The album was one of the most successful of 2006. Welcome to the Black Parade is the UK's official number one single. It's from the album of the same name. At first, we were like, oh, what the hell, they're done for. Friend of the band, Alex Saavedra. And then it started working. <laughs> we were like, oh, okay, well now I'm starting to get it. Now I see where they're going with this. I also think it's cool the way that... Black Parade opens up for My Chemical Romance at shows, and then they come back out and do a set as My Chemical Romance. I think it's genius. I think it's really fun. Not only have the band become the Black Parade, but Gerard Way has started writing his own comic book called The Umbrella Academy. It's hard to explain what it's about because it's very much like Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol. It's not supposed to feel like a superhero comic at all, actually. It's supposed to feel like a very bizarre, almost European family piece, you know, I guess I take a lot of experience from the band and inject it into the comic. So could it be that a band of men, sculpted by the tragedy of 9-11, who set off on a mission to make a difference, have finally, after six years, succumbed to their fate? Took me have they and their fans finally accepted that they are, after all, superheroes? He said, son, when you grow up, would you be the savior of the broken, the beaten, and the damned? I mean, they're not superheroes in the literal sense where they're, like, pushing babies, you know, away from, like, falling uh, safes or something, and they're not saving people from cars or whatever, but they definitely are superheroes in that they inspire people to become better, and they're really all about helping people. So the cliche thing is, MCR saved my life, and in that way, yes, they are superheroes because they have taken people out from their dark moments with their music. I guess they are superheroes in their own way, whether they have a costume or not. I know they're five normal people, but they're just, they're amazing in their own way. Especially when you're up on stage and like when we're playing as the Black Parade, you really feel like a superhero. It's great, actually.
I just always wanted to be one of those bands that's remembered forever. I don't want to be a band that's like a footnote. That's the ultimate goal. We want to be mentioned as a band that maybe did something different or maybe did something great. If we don't have anything to say and we don't have anything new, then we'll stop. But hopefully we keep going on this path and we keep growing. Because we really never sought to hide what we really were. And I think what we really are is geeks and outsiders.